I want to welcome you all here at Sala. Uh, we are really lucky to have a location where we can have this kind of events. We're going to be recording these events, so if you have friends that um, didn't have a chance to come tonight or that uh, are not in town, uh, we'll put the video at the GROMC, J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee website as soon as our fabulous FAC8 uh, um, edits it and makes it nice. Um, I am the Vice Chair of the J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee, as, and this event is co-sponsored by three different organizations, or uh, five, <laughs> if we count them all. <laughs> and uh, we, they, they make it possible for this event to be free for us all. So, um, for those of you who might not know, not be familiar with the J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee, we are a non-profit organization that honors the intellectual and ethical legacy of the scientific director of the Manhattan Project. Since 1971, so we just celebrated our 50th anniversary a couple of years ago, and with the financial support of our wonderful uh, community, we have been sponsoring events uh, like the annual series uh, memorial lecture that some of you are familiar with at the Dwayne Smith Auditorium. But we are also um, support local <coughs> scholarships for students here in Los Alamos and also regional students so they can go to college with our support. And um, these are students from Los Alamos, Pojoaque, and Santa Fe High Schools. And that's what some of you saw. Uh, we had some shirts. So the benefit, the, the proceeds from those shirts that we were selling at the entrance are for this kind of uh, fundraising. Tonight, we also have uh, Tony Hinojosa, who will introduce the Southwest Free Series. Hello, everybody. Nice seeing you. So I was born and raised in Los Alamos. I grew up skiing at Pajarito. So when I heard this event, I thought that was great. I want to know the history. I mean, I think I was part of the history. I was one of the first snowboarders back when the 80s when they first allowed it. I used to compete in high school in what's called the USASA, which is the United States of America Snowboard and Free Ski Association. So I competed all over New Mexico, Colorado. I went to the national championships numerous times. I've won some national championships myself. And the way that organization works is there's 30 different series all over the United States. And the winner of those local series go to the national championships. The winners of the national championships, they go on to World Cups, US Opens, Olympics. So I like to say if you want to go all the way to pro Olympic, that level, you have to start at the USASA. So here in New Mexico, it's the USASA Southwest Freeride Series, which I am the director of the Southwest Freeride Series. I organize events all over northern New Mexico. That's how I got into all this. I also really reach out to the kids in our community, not just the competitors. I'm the head elementary PE teacher for Los Alamos Public Schools. Oh, there's some students up there. <laughs> So I started the fifth grade ski and snowboard program years ago, kind of stalled out with COVID the last couple of years, but we are bringing it back. Thank you to our new general manager, Jason, up there. Jason, we're going to make this all happen, get the fifth and sixth graders up there. So if you guys want to help support that, please donate to the Los Alamos Ski Club which is kind of confusing. They don't own Parito Mountain anymore, but the Los Alamos Ski Club is helping fund the fifth and sixth grade ski program. Right? So back to the Southwest Freeride Series, I did that when I was a kid all by myself, which was kind of a bummer because everyone else had coaches and teams. And so we started the Southwest Freeride Team. I want to introduce you to Brandon Hill here. He's the president of the Southwest Freeride Team. He'll tell you a little bit about that. Hi, I'm Brandon Hill, and I'm the president of the Southwest Freeride Team. Uh, we are a local group of skiers and snowboarders. I'm one of the coaches. We have a couple coaches also here in town. We're a nonprofit, and we are a team just to 
get everybody together and go and compete in the USA SA series. Um, that's about it. I wasn't really ready. I'm not, uh, I'm not a good, te uh, good uh, talker or teacher like uh, Tony, but I can coach. Yeah, so just to be clear, I host all the events. The kids are welcome to come compete. They don't need to be part of a team, but if they want the support of a team, there you go. There's the team right there. Now, when I'm not snowboarding in the winter and the off season, I love mountain biking which is how I got introduced to Miss Mary Grow over here. Mary Grow started the Los Alamos High School mountain bike team a couple years ago, and they used to have to compete in Arizona because we didn't have a competitive series in New Mexico. So Mary, just like me, decided to start her own series here. So she is the head of the New Mexico NICA organization. I don't even know what NICA stands for. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tony. So, yep, I just started up the New Mexico NICA organization in New Mexico in 2022. Um, NICA stands for National Interscholastic Cycling Association. The whole idea is to get kids on bikes in middle school and high school, just like basketball teams, cross country teams, so that they have, like Tony said, you aren't just one kid out mountain biking by themselves. Um, this is a need I've seen for a long time because my kids are passionate about mountain biking. Um, started teams and that sort of just progressed and progressed into now I run the statewide series. It's another nonprofit and racing is part of it, but we talk a lot about its youth development on bikes. We're trying to teach these kids to be outdoor stewards, teach them to grow strong, not just with their bodies, but with their minds and their characters and building a great community. So that's NICA. Um, and as Tony mentioned, I also run the Los Alamos mountain bike team um, with a bunch of volunteer coaches here in town. And it's the same idea. We have about 30 kids registered on the team and about a quarter of them choose to race. So racing is optional. It's all about building this community of being outdoors together, which is, I think, what skiing and mountain biking are all about. So thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Mary. Sometimes I wonder if we realize how lucky we are. <laughs> and with that said, we're going to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, our speaker is George Lawrence, uh, past president of the Los Alamos Ski Club. George is a longtime resident of Los Alamos, a retired Lano project physicist who led some advanced particle accelerator technology efforts in his 37 year, years career at Lano. Gee. He was first on skis. Um, he said very rudimentary equipment um, uh, during college and grad school, but it didn't really take up until uh, much later, uh, in the early uh, 1970s at Pajarito, when he was uh, being drafted into that such activity by his wife. He is now an enthusiastic senior skier. Um, he says that now he uses excellent equipment. And, uh, and skis as many days as possible each winter at Pajarito. I wonder if we can recognize you after you wear your helmet and your face mask <laughs> and, um, and so on. So um, he not only Pajarito, he skis in uh, Ski Santa Fe, Sipapu, Taos, Wolf Creek, Warner, Purgatory, Snowmass, and any other New Mexico or Colorado ski areas that offer reduced rates uh, for eight or even free super senior lift tickets. Uh, he was in the Los Alamos Ski Club, uh, board of directors for about 10 years uh, in the 2000s and early uh, 2010, and was the president of the ski club in 2006, 2007, and played a major role in bringing Pajarito's introductory snowmaking system into existence here in Pajarito. He maintains a strong interest in the water pipeline project that many of you might have read in the newspaper and stays in close touch with Pajarito Mountain <coughs> managers and uh, Los Alamos County Utilities managers who are driving the action. With that said, let's welcome our speaker tonight. Well, thank, thank you all for coming. Um, this is the first time I've given a talk of any kind in, in five years. And the last time I gave a talk, 
It was uh, for history on tap, history of ski, history of, of Los Amos Ski Club, and I carried it from the beginnings at Sawyer's Hill and so forth, up to about 2000, which was sort of the pinnacle of the successful part of the of the Parido um, ski area. And things started to change a bit after that. And I said at the end of that talk, I said. Um, that's for a future discussion. And so I thought this time around I should really carry it forward all the way over the last 25 years. I've done my best to sort of describe to you what happened in that part, but I'm still gonna go back and start at Sawyer's Hill. So um, this, this talk is really, it, it says history of skiing, but it's really the history of ski facilities in Los Alamos. As I'm not going to talk about ski racing club. I'm not going to talk about um, uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> ski school or, or any other, which you might call user aspect, ski, ski school or, or ski patrol. I'm certainly not going to talk about the um, mountain bike uh, capabilities of Parido Mountain, which we all know is now pretty spectacular in the summer. That's a talk to be given by somebody else at another time. So anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's dive in and see what happens. So three pictures here on the introductory slide. The first one is from the cover of uh, Diana Kirby's book, Just Cra Crazy to Ski, and shows um, somebody doing a snow plow at, um, at Sawyer's Hill. The second one is Parito Mountain in its mature state on, on the Aspen Slope on a typical race day. And the third one is uh, showing uh, snowmaking occurring on West Beginners on one of the few times you've actually been able to have snowmaking on West Beginners. So, um, there was skiing, as I said, there was skiing at Los Alamos before the Manhattan Project. The ranch school boys, they skied at Sawyer's Hill and Parido Mountain from the 1930s up till till the Manhattan Project appeared. And they, were, they, they cleared some rudimentary slopes at Sawyer's Hill. Uh, it had decent, in quotes, road access. It wasn't all that decent a lot of the time. and It's hard to access, but it was a road. Uh, there were no toes, so skiers had to skin or hike up. Um, the boys did an annual one-week ski trip up to Camp May Cabin in the early spring, and they, they used horse transport in the snow, and they struggled up there, had some fun. And most of the skiing there was on a big cleared area at the bottom of what is now Big Mother, which you can see, whoops, sorry, um, which you can see on the lower right, right here. Uh, more adventurous skiers had to climb higher, higher up the mountain. So Sawyer's Hill, as most of you know, was the first Los Alamos ski area. And um, the project accumulated scientists and engineers and, and people uh, began gathering in 1943 in a race to develop the first nuclear device. And uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of tension in the project, um, high intensity projects. And so outdoor recreation, both summer and winter, was important to relieve that tension and the more strenuous, the better, and it was encouraged from the, the top management. Many of the scientists were from Europe, and some knew about skiing. And they started doing ski touring in the Hamas Mountains, and also at Sawyer's Hill, but without toes. So in the summer of 1944, uh, GI John Rogers uh, started getting keen about what could be done at Sawyer's Hill, and he organized some volunteers <coughs> to widen the existing uh, Sawyer's Hill slopes and prepare a path for a possible road tow. And for those of you who are maybe not familiar with where Sawyer's Hill actually was, um, this shows uh, Highway 4 coming out to the back gate and going up here until after a few turns, there's a pull-off to your right, which maybe some of you don't know where, what that is, and that's where Sawyer's Hill ski area was. Parito over here, of course. Um, so, uh, in November 44, uh, John Rogers uh, formed the Sawyer's Hill Ski Toe Association. 
and that was organized to fund and acquire Roto. And uh, he, he and, and some others went down to Albuquerque to scrounge some parts, and they acquired a 1932 Chrysler engine, Model A Ford wheels, and they got some manila rope, which is really in terrible condition <laughs> from a defunct circus. And so uh, putting all that together somehow, rope toe number one was operational by Christmas, and the skiers were thrilled to be able to enjoy that. And of course, there were a lot of operational troubles. The, the engine was very cranky, often didn't want to start. But anyway, they were having fun. Um, some of the first members of this uh, Sawyers Hill Tow Association um, were quite famous scientists, including people like Hans Bethe, Enrico Fermi, Bob Bakker, and Vicky Weisskopf. And some of them were later Nobel Prize winners, maybe all of these guys, I'm not sure. Uh, Professor Weisskopf was actually one of my professors when I was an undergraduate at MIT. That tells you how old I am. <laughs> um, so Sawyers Hill was Los Alamos skiers' playground from all the way from 44 to 57. And improvements came <clears throat> to the number one tow in 45 and 46. And it provided 350 feet of vertical, which was the best in the state for a short time north of, of Sandia Peak. More slopes were being cut and improved, and actually a small lodge was constructed. And um, they installed a, a short beginner's tow in 1948 to introduce, introduce uh, beginners to the activity. And this, this uh, photo here shows Luther Rick Rickerson minding the cranky number one tow engine. And over here, you see skiers on the main slope at Sawyer's Hill. So a few pictures showing what life was like there. Um, the, um, this is showing how people boarding the, the number one tow. And these two pictures on the bottom are of the lodge, um, outside and inside. This was actually built by the Zia company. Can't it's government-built lodge. Can't imagine that sort of thing occurring now. <laughs> Um, on the upper right here, we have the first ski esta, people in formal wear uh, pretending to be at a ball. And that was the first ski esta, and this is a tradition that's gone on every year, I think, without interruption ever since. And the, uh, the, uh, in 1946, the, the Los Alamos Ski Club uh, was formed from the Soares Hill Ski Tow Association, and the membership was 120. So this is a um, <clears throat> ski map, um, a, a uh, trail map of Sawyer's Hill. It's, um, it's a little bit misleading because if you see here the road, I think you know that the road is really goes this way. And so you ought to rotate this, this map about 75 degrees counterclockwise. And uh, this shows the main slope. Here is the north slope, which was created later. Um, with a north toe in 1953 providing access quite a bit higher, 550 feet above the lodge, and that accessed several new slopes. But perennial problem was the fact that the elevation was, was too low, um, the snow didn't stick around, and it was, was uh, as much east-facing as, as north-facing, really not north, it was mainly east-facing. This picture, which is uh, one of the rare color photos of of um, Sawyer's Hill shows people setting up a slalom course on the North Slope. So people in, and by the late 50s, uh, the poor snow years that um, caused people to really start reconsidering the terrain at Parito Mountain. People knew about ter uh, Parito Mountain. It was 1,500 feet higher than the top of Sawyer's Hill. But the access was so difficult that they had uh, not really pushed very hard to try and think of building anything up there. But people were really getting sick and tired of skiing on what they said was a few blades of grass. So a scouting party was sent up, check out Parito in March 57. And that included people like Dale Holm, uh, Stretch Fretwell, and Bill Jarmy, um, some of the pioneers. And here's the, here's the scouting group stuck on Neversheim Hill, they had to ski the rest of the way in. And over here you see Stretch Fretwell and 
home uh, surveying Parito from the Camp May cabin, which uh, I think the structure is essentially all gone now. Maybe the fireplace is still there. So um, the club voted to make the move in the spring of 57. The major problem, of course, was accessing it by the uh, narrow rutted jeep track. So um, it so happened that Bob Thorne, who was an enthusiastic skier, he was on the uh, county council, actually county commissioners, they called them in those days. And he helped obtaining funding to widen and straighten the road and, and uh, put down a six inch gravel surface. And I read in Deanna Kirby's book uh, that that whole thing cost about $8,000. <laughs> so money well spent. Um, so um, people wanted to try to get to do some skiing at Parito that, that winter. So volunteers cut a modest beginner's area and a couple of, quote, advanced slopes higher on the mountain. And after some last minute heroic efforts in early snow, a Parito opened for skiing on November 12th. Here you can see the original road, or Jeep track, really. And here the, there's the opening of the, of the improved road uh, just before they got open the ski area. And this is what the ski area looked like in the late fall of 57. So <clears throat> scavenged equipment got things going. Rope toes came over from Sawyer's Hill. And they also were able to get hold of a um, a lodge, in quotes, which was an old uh, Army Gamma II building that was originally one of the ones around the pond uh, in the Manhattan Project days, hauled it up to the ski area and placed it on uh, a bed of, of aspen tree logs for the first winter. That was the first lodge. And here you can see a picture of someone riding tow number one, which went up 605 feet between, uh, you could still see very faintly, you can still see where the, the track was, went up between the Mouse Run and Spring Pitch. And tow number two served the beginner's area and went up 250 feet. So the next steps at Parito, there's, there's a lot of detail here, I realize, but thought you might be interested. Um, the focus for 57 to 60 was developing slopes. Lower Lumberyard, expanded beginner's area, and then upper Lumberyard and Aspen. And the north toe at Sawyer was brought over in 59. And that went uh, 485 feet to the top of Lumberyard. That was labeled toe number three. And that thing was really terrible to ride. You needed arms of steel, and you absolutely had to have toe grippers. I think younger people in the audience may not know what toe grippers were. <laughs> but these were things like a, a vice that fastened onto the rope and, and clipped to a belt around the skier. So more people were joining the club, serious money was coming in. The club then voted rather narrowly to purchase a T-bar lift in 61 uh, to replace the, uh, the two rope toes. And that was installed in time for the 62-63 season. And uh, you, you, uh, the correct way to write it was like this. And provide, even so, it was still tricky to get on and off for some people, especially children. If, uh, if, a, if a child was riding with you when you were an adult, the T was sort of tilted very hard and it was rather challenging to ride. And there were other ways people could ride the lift. There's maybe an example of not how to do it. So anyway, um, it, uh, it was there. So uh, more ski, ski slopes were becoming available. The membership was continuing to climb. Uh, the volunteers were cutting slopes at the rate of one or more per year. And the club membership uh, was growing at about 16% per year. And skiing was really catching fire in Los Alamos. This was, this was way before internet and computers. And uh, people needed something to do in the winter. And this was it in Los Alamos. At one time, when Los Alamos had a, I think at the peak, Los Alamos had a population of maybe 17,000 people. There were over 4,000 members of the ski club. So it was a real ski town. So uh, the first chairlift was installed on Lone Spruce in the summer of 69. And lift, lift lines started appearing for the first time. 
So that was causing an issue. Um, these pictures on the right show you how the, the, the uh, slope development was proceeding, 65 to 66 over here, winter of 69, 70 here, and 71, 72. Um, the development was uh, going east. Uh, this here is um, Lone Spruce, and you can see Daisy May and the slopes to the east of that. And this is the Aspen Slope for, ref for reference. So um, how did the ski club function? <clears throat> the club members, um, when you bought a, a season pass, you were a club member. And um, the club members elected a board of directors. And the board included a president and, and several other officers. And committees of the board uh, were the ones that planned the slopes and the, and the new lifts and every major thing that was going on. And there were general club meetings two or three times per year. And membership, there were membership votes required on any major capital expenditures and decisions on the direction of the uh, ski area and the club. Oh, wait a minute. Um, uh, the first, first proper lodge was built in 1962, largely due to the efforts of Carl Buckland. And that replaced the uh, old army building. This was the first real lodge. And it became uh, quite, quite heavily occupied rather rapidly. There was a deck out front, and there was a big fireplace in the middle, which I didn't have space to show. But anyway, it, but, um, the one thing it didn't have was indoor toilets. Those were, those were outside. And uh, a, a source of irritation for members for a long time, <laughs> as you can imagine, especially the ladies, I think. Um, so I'm really not going to be able to do justice to the way the ski area was built, but um, Parvita Mountain was really built by ski club volunteers over 40 years, four decades, from 1957 to 1997. Tremendous effort, uh, dedicated crews, five to 10 people with chainsaws on weekends, and then on Wednesday evenings as well. And they, <clears throat> some of them called themselves the Rat Pack. And it was, I think there's a couple of them here tonight. And it was a, was a way of life for them. It was a social thing as well as, as building the ski area. And they got, they got to name the slopes, of course. Um, and there's a, a funny story that I've heard, whether or not it's true, about the naming of uh, one of the slopes, Big Mother in particular, that there was an old guy who was doing a lot of it, not one of these, not one of the volunteers, but commercial guy who was helping to cut the trees on that slope. And there were a lot of big trees. And it, he was a pretty, he had a lot of salty language. And every time he cut down a big tree, he would say something like, that's a big effing mother. <laughs> and uh, this went on repeatedly and repeatedly. And so Bob Thorne, who was leading the whole effort, uh, said, well, maybe we should name the slope Mother Effort. <laughs> but um, the other members of the team persuaded him that was a bit raw, and so it ended up as uh, Big Mother. <laughs> anyway, and there were other stories which perhaps um, the, some of the members here can share about uh, um, the reason for the way the slope's names ended up the way they did. I think I've been told, especially the uh, Fab Four, but anyway, so Bob Thorne, who's pictured here, was the leader of the effort for about 30 years. And then after he died, uh, Harry Flaw and Ron Strong carried on the leadership. And amazingly, they're both here tonight. So thanks for Yay! showing up. Yeah. And there were major work parties every fall, typically 100 to 200 members. and big barbecues after the days of work. So altogether, um, I think Thorne estimated in 1985 that the club had put in 50 to 60 man years of free labor, which <laughs> included the construction of two lodges. It's really amazing. I can't myself quite comprehend it. Anyway, here's a few pictures that show the work that was done. These are people. Uh, cutting up trees that have been cut down and putting them into piles. 
called bucking, I think. And then uh, these piles had to be burned, and it was very difficult because this was green wood and it didn't want to burn. So they, I think they poured on lots of diesel fuel and had heavy duty igniters and it was really dirty, dirty work. But somehow they got it done. Um, here's a picture of, a, of an, a used bulldozer that the club bought to do some reshaping of the terrain where required. And um, I don't, th don't know if this picture is showing up real well, but shows some logs on one of the cut slopes. And even after all this, there was still a lot of work to be done on each slope, getting rid of rocks and stumps. And so some of the stumps got blown up in the Los Alamos, so a lot of explosives <laughs> experts, and a lot of uh, rock rolling was done. So tremendous effort, the whole thing. So slope expansion continued to the west uh, on land that was acquired, purchased from the Dunnigan ranch family. And that was, this was in another county. This was uh, in Sandoval, is in Sandoval County. And um, <clears throat> the mother chairlift to service that area was installed in 76 and provided access to quite a bit steeper terrain, including the Fab Four, precious, breathless, breathless Sidewinder, another mother, another mother. So you can see these slopes now on the west side. This is this is Big Mother right here for reference. So uh, Parito and the ski club continued growing into the 80s and 90s, and the first professional manager was hired in 1980 when Sig Hecker was president. I think uh, it was Bruce Gavitt. Um, the beginner chair replaced toe number two in 81. Espen chair replaced the T-bar in 82. And we had a, 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 lot, a, lot more incre a lot more uphill capacity. So the lift lines disappeared for a while. Um, these pictures here show the construction of the lodge, the, the second lodge, which is the one that's there today. Contractor put up the steel framing but the, all the, everything else was done by the volunteers. And they, um, uh, the volunteers stopped cutting slopes, for, I think, for two years while they changed uh, direction and worked on building the lodge and the deck. And as, as you all know, it's the lodge is the centerpiece of Skiesta. And it's worked out really well for us over the years. It has two floors, cafeteria, running water, rental shop, and very importantly, flush toilets. So, <laughs> right, I think they're being improved this year from what I read. Um, thought I would show you the land acquisition um, as a history. Um, the ski area of Parito started out with, with uh, leasing this area here in the middle in 19, in, in uh, 57 from the AEC. And then in, in 67, 68, when the AEC was getting rid of, of a lot of property, both in town and elsewhere, um, this, this, the, this area and the blue area were purchased from the AEC for not very much money. And then the, the uh, next, next major purchase was the uh, West Peak land from the Dunnigan family in 1974. And this had, this had an encumbrance, which I'll come back to later. Um, then uh, the, the ski area was filled out by purchase from the forest, from the uh, Forest Service purchasing uh, these two areas in 1985 and 86, and at the same time uh, getting, acquiring this triangle here that filled in. So that's a quick history of the, um, how the area developed. So, um, Heavy snowfalls in the late 80s and the early 90s, which I think people thought were never going to go away, encouraged expansion eastward on, on, land that, on that land that had been acquired from the Forest Service. And the uh, membership peaked up at around 4,300 in 1992. Townsite uh, uh, town Quad Chair in 1994 opened up that new east area. And it's... it's um, and in, in that area has, at least in recent years, has hardly ever opened. It does have issues in, in that um, it's more east-facing than the rest of the ski area. So 
hard to retain snow, and it has other issues as well, but maybe the new management is gonna make that all work once the pipeline comes in. We'll see. Okay, um, so the ski air reached slope build out full maturity in 1997. And this is shown here in this aerial shot, which does show the east area and um, all the way over to Evershine Hill over here. Um, and it just shows the three of the chairlifts, the Aspen chair, the spruce chair, the mother chair, and not shown are the beginner chair and the townsite chair. So mature ski area. Okay, so now we come to 2000 and uh, the next quarter century, and there have been some changes and some major challenges. That's what I want to go into now. This is an outline of what I want to talk about. Uh, but first, we had to deal with the Cerro Grande wildfire at 2000 that did some extensive damage to the east side. Um, we acquired new management. Um, there were lower snowfalls and declining membership in the ski club. Snowmaking system was designed and installed. Um, the Las Conchas wildfire in 2011 did more damage to much of the ski area. And so we, the area, <coughs> the ski area and the club began to struggle financially, culminating facing the possibility of a shutdown in 2014. But private partnership stepped in, to my mind, almost miraculously and uh, the uh, club accepted what they th thought was the arrangement that should be pursued and the operation continued without a hitch. There was never any shutdown. And um, after a while, there was a transfer, of co a complete transfer of Pareto land and assets to this private partnership. And I'll go into how that all happened. And then finally talk a little bit about the pipeline project. Okay, in 2001 to 2004, Norm McKinnon uh, was, was uh, hired as general, as general manager. He was a Canadian, uh, fairly, um, um, I, I'm not sure I should use the right word, crusty character, uh, strong opinions. He rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. I, I sort of liked him myself. Uh, he wanted to straighten things out. He thought, Parvito was too much of an amateur operation, and he was going to show us how to do it right. And he was hired as his specialty was rescuing ski areas that were in trouble, and, and we were in trouble. So um, he, he, man, he modernized the financial management system, which needed it pretty strongly. And his major contribution, to my mind, was that with a lot of homework and research and lobbying, um, he managed to get a settlement from FEMA as a result of the Cerro Grande fire damage, which was huge. It was, I'm not allowed to say what the actual amount was, but it was millions. And it provided an, a lease on life financially for, for uh, Pajarito and for the ski club. So under his management, the first terrain park was installed on Lower Lumberyard. And uh, we, op we reopened um, snowmaking and water supply for snowmaking studies. Uh, the board had looked at snowmaking earlier, but it had been set aside. And um, uh, we thought that the board thought maybe it was time to, re to reopen this and see if there was a way to proceed. Um, <clears throat> the, the heavy snowfall winters uh, ceased. And um, I think one or two times, the, the not, not in Norm's uh, administration, but one or two times in this period, the Christmas opening was, was missed. And uh, I think there was even one time where uh, open, the area didn't open at all. So uh, the club membership so starts dropping. It dropped below 3,000. And the uh, annual revenue was declining uh, below break even. So after Norm left, Tom Long uh, from Sandia took over as general manager. And he's been general manager until very recently, started in 2004. And a lot of stuff happened under his administration. Uh, early on, um, we purchased some additional snow cats and uh, slope grooming improved. Um, 
a large terrain park was constructed, was constructed on another mother. And uh, importantly, the Camp May Road was paved end to end. And this was really important because this meant the county could plow the road mm -hmm. and the uh, famous uh, Parito traffic jams that would appear in the old days on Neversheim Hill pretty much disappeared. So um, during, this, during the early part of Tom's um, administration, we did, the board developed a snowmaking plan. We thought this maybe was the only way to, to reverse the financial decline. And the focus initially was in, in evaluating the potential water sources for this. Um, we looked at four things. Los Alamos County recycled water, uh, recycled water from the lab's computing center, Los Alamos Canyon stream at the reservoir, and collecting snow melt on the ski area west side. And the board, in the late 90s, the board had, had uh, done a lot of measurements to see how much water could be collected on, um, from the snow melt, and that looked very promising. Um, the other three got dismissed uh, fairly quickly. Los Alamos County recycled water, it doesn't have reverse osmosis, so it's not proper for a ski area. Uh, recycled water from the computing center didn't look um, like it was secure because the, the lab and the ACE and the, the Department of Energy were working hard to reduce water use, and we thought that, that us, if we took water from there, it would run out in the fairly near future. We did do a lot of measurements of the Los Alamos Canyon stream at the reservoir, and for a while that looked promising, but then when we hit really dry years, that stream just didn't look adequate. So during, during this same period of time, we had a big uh, celebration, the 50th anniversary, and that was, that was quite a party. Uh, it was a three-day event. People came from all over the country. Um, there were a lot of people who hadn't seen each other for years. I saw, I saw some people crying. It was quite an event. Um, the county, uh, in 2008, I think, the county received 650 k from the state uh, to improve fire protection system at, at Pajarito. And we had been working with um, Jim Hall, who was on the council and then was, was representative to the uh, legislature. And he was instrumental in, in acquiring these funds. And so the, the uh, utilities department designed a, uh, a, a system which consisted of a collection weir for the snow melt um, at the bottom of, ba basically the bottom of, of uh, Big Mother, and a pumping system there, and a 250,000 gallon storage tank, and then fire hydrant pipelines to uh, uh, provide the fire protection of the base area. And uh, around that same time, we developed a comprehensive snowmaking project proposal and put it forward to the ski club. And it was approved um, by an overwhelming margin, like seven or eight to one. So this was a, br a very quick look at what the project involved, the snowmaking plan and project. Uh, the idea was to, um, to make snow on on uh, Lone Spruce and Lumberyard. Uh, the core of the system was a 10 million gallon pond at the top of the mountain. And um, <clears throat> we calculated that with about 7 million gallons, we could cover uh, Lone Spruce and Lumberyard, the beginner's area, and all the connecting areas. And that, so that would be the priority for, for the snowmaking system. And if there was enough water left over, we could also start putting some snow down on the adjacent slopes and hope that Mother Nature would add to it and we'd have more than just two slopes to ski on for the beginning of the year. So the, um, the, uh, the two parts of this were that the county was building the, the uh, system that, that was covered by the 650K. That was a collection weir down here at the, um, the bottom of, of Mother, a pump station down here that pushed the water up to this tank, which is at the bottom of Pussycat, 250,000 gallons. 
and that's a fire protection tank. But water, once the fire protection is taken care of, any extra water can be pushed up the hill. So um, the uh, ski club constructed a pipeline that ran up, ran under Lumberyard on the west side of Lumberyard, up to the top of the mountain and over and into the pond, and also constructed um, snowmaking pipeline across Spruce's Boulevard and down Lone Spruce, and then Brent, this, this one, the Lumberyard line branched off to the uh, west side of Beginners. The Lumberyard line could be used in both directions, uphill for filling the pond and downhill for snowmaking. So the, uh, the uh, ski club construction um, was covered the 10 million gallon storage pond, the pond filling pipeline, the snowmaking pipelines, two pump stations, the one here next to the, to the big tank for pushing the water up the hill, and then one next to the pond for pushing water into the snowmaking lines. Snow gun pedestals down um, Lone Spruce and across the top and the beginner area. Uh, we were not able to uh, do the pedestals down Lumberyard, that's yet to be done, and snow gun purchases. And this was to be financed by 500K from the uh, club savings and uh, 1250K long-term loan from Los Alamos National Bank. And the rest of it was being done by Pareto staff labor. So a lot of work. Um, I thought maybe a little bit of snowmaking 101. Um, one can give a, a big lecture on this whole thing all by itself, but Basically, in snowmaking, you're not forming, you're not forming the kind of flakes that you that uh, Mother Nature provides. They're little ice crystals which are formed by nozzles, rings of nozzles, or a small number of nozzles if it's a different um, a kind of unit, um, backed by high pressure water and air, and it requires low temperature and humidity. And typical numbers are 20 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 degree, 20 percent humidity but there's actually a broad range of numbers in which you can make snow. And, ma and snow making is typically done at night because that's when you have these parameters at their best. So the man-made snow is much denser than natural snow. It's 40% water, and natural snow is anywhere from 3% to 15% water. So a big difference, but uh, provides a really durable base for natural snowfall accumulation. But once, once, once the snow is made, that's not the end of the job. Uh, you have to farm it and till it to provide a good skiing surface. And down here are shown the two kinds of snow guns. These look like jet engines, and they're called fan guns. And they can, they can produce prodigious amounts of snow over very large slope areas. But they're very expensive. Like They cost as much as a car, like $40,000 each. And over here are the other kind called lances or sometimes water sticks. And they make smaller amounts of snow, but they're quite a bit cheaper. And uh, nowadays, modern snow guns are supplied just with high pressure water and electric power. And they have onboard air compressors, so they don't need an external source of compressed air. And onboard weather stations, and they're computer controlled from a central location. So. Um, what actually happened, 2009, uh, Utilities Department constructs the, the county's part of the system, the snow melt collection and fire protection system. Uh, the club selected Techno Alpin, um, a European-based uh, um, snowmaking snow making company selected as the engineering and equipment vendor. And the club, as I've said before, the club approved the, uh, the plan in a strong vote. And uh, Pyrito and Techno Alpin built the first part of the system infrastructure in that year. And that included the pipeline up Lumberyard to the storage pond, storage pond excavation and lining done by Sam Gardner's outfit, and uh, the pump station next to the, the big 250 kilogallon tank. That was all done in 2009. 2010 to 2011, finished up the construction, uh, snow gun purchases, 
four, we, I think we acquired four fixed gun, fixed fans, four mobile fans, and four lances. And we should have had 25, but that's all we could afford. And the pond was filled from spring runoff in, in the spring of 2010. It got up to 10 million gallons, but tragically there was a major leak discovered. So we had to empty it completely and repair the leak. There was a lot of rending of garments and, and heavy words about all that. But um, the pipelines and pedestals were put in, as I've said, on Lone Spruce and Boulevard, West Beginners. And um, in addition, there was a French drain put in place in Salamander Gully for collecting uh, subsurface water. And in the, we found out after a couple of years of use that there was as much water coming, coming down Salamander Gully underground in the spring as there was on the surface. So that was a very useful addition. A few pictures of the construction effort. Stacks of ductile iron pipe in the parking lot. The pipe was not welded. It was connected with O-ring joints. Uh, <coughs> showing the uh, pond filling pipeline trench moving up Lumberyard. Over here is a picture of a special unit we had to hire. Uh, it's called a spider mounted backhoe, which allowed uh, trench digging on steep slope. This is working on upper Lumberyard. This shows clearing of the storage pond site on top of the mountain and the pond excavation in progress. Then uh, finishing the pond, November 2009, lining the pond in December, just before snow was falling. Here's a picture of the 250,000 gallon tank and, and the pump station that drives the water up the hill. And then the uh, pump and plumbing inside that that uh, pump station. This is what the uh, pond looked like, partly filled in May 2010. Picture of the snow making pump station next to the pond and one of the big fan guns making snow on uh, beginners and uh, the row of fixed guns that exist today on, on Lone Spruce. So what happened um, in 2010 to 2014? Uh, the project, the snowmaking project, runs out of cash in 2011. Um, so we were not able to complete the, the lumberyard line. Um, low snowpack winters were leading to only partly filled storage pond, and the, the pond liner kept developing leaks. Um, so in general, we had a low stored water retention. Um, the uh, the club ran out of operating money by the summer of 2014, and Par so Parito faced a potential shutdown for the winter of 14-15. So, um, what to do? Well, uh, this gentleman here showed up, James Coleman, the managing partner of uh, Texas Capital Partners, who had um, purchased Sipapu and made improvements over 10 to 15 years. And he came to the ski club and he made a, basically a rescue proposal. He proposed a partnership between the county, his organization, and the ski club. And I'll show you what, what that arrangement would be uh, geographically. And this was after a lot of discussion in a ski club meeting in September 14, the club voted to proceed with that approach. So uh, Texas Capital Partners uh, later called themselves Parito Recreation uh, Limited Partnership. They ran Parito from 2014 to 2017 using an operating license granted by the, the club. And they took over the payments on the long-term loan to uh, Los Alamos National Bank. <clears throat> There's a lot, the, the jargon here keeps changing a bit, um, but TCP refers to Texas Capital Partners, which they called themselves initially. Now they call themselves Mountain Capital Partners. And my understanding is that's the umbrella organization for all of their, um, their facilities. And under each one is something like Parito Recreational LP. I think that's still the name given to the, the uh, entity that runs Parito. So um, the proposed, part, proposed arrangement 
for 2014 ended up like this, that a majority of the land, which is all, all the skiable area basically here, was to be transferred to Los Alamos County. Zones that might be developed, uh, such as with condominiums or restaurant or whatever purpose, are shown here in this blue-gray. Those were to be um, transferred to uh, Parvito Recreation. And uh, all the buildings, the lifts, and equipment, of course, are transferred also to that entity. And over here on the right, we left that for the future uh, for the reason that um, when this land was transferred by the Dunnigan family to the club, there was a writer on, or a stipulation on the uh, sale that said that if, the, if this, this piece was ever, trans, ever sold or transferred to another organization, by the club, that the Dunnigan family should have a right of first refusal. So uh, ROFR for, as an abbreviation. So we, we just didn't want to deal with that, so that was left for the future, and it still is. Um, so uh, while this was all going on, it was beginning to become very clear to everybody that Parito Mountain had to have an assured water supply if the snowmaking system was going to be successful and if, if we could really go forward. Because um, experience over a number of years showed that uh, much of the time the snowmelt collection scheme doesn't really fill the storage pond. So we looked at several, quote, reliable water sources. The, the canyon stream again, we dismissed that pretty quickly. Uh, we looked into the idea of drilling a deep well at the base of the ski area would have to have been very deep, like a couple thousand feet. The idea being that maybe you could put a well into the same formation that uh, the county draws its water from. It's called the Santa Fe Formation. But um, even to drill a pilot well looked like a couple million dollar project. So that didn't look like a reasonable way to go. So we ended with, after discussions with the then county manager, Harry Burgess, you may remember him, um, we thought that connecting a pipeline uh, from the Los Alamos County water distribution system was the only reasonable way to go. So uh, the county, the ski club, and Mountain Capital Partners agreed on a Camp May Road pipeline concept that I'll show you in a minute. And the design was developed by Wilson and Company, architect engineering firm in Albuquerque, using county funds. And the initial construction cost estimate was 3.4 million. So what would the pipeline do? Um, provides reliable filling of the fire protection tank and the pond for, uh, for every fire season. Uh, Make sure we've got a full storage pond for snowmaking every November. And it allows, therefore allows Parita to open reliably before the Christmas holiday season. And that's when, of course, uh, huge amount of revenue typically comes in, so very important to have that. It also increases the potable water supply for the Parito Base area. Right now, uh, Parito is still relying on a one gallon a minute well that's, that's drilled into a perched water supply 400 feet down, and that supply is a 70 kilogallon tank. So with this pipeline, which is potable water, uh, all these, all the potable water issues, uh, shortages for Parito uh, go away. It also, um, if you run a, a feeder line off of this thing up to Camp May, it makes Camp May quite a bit more attractive with potable water up there. So um, this is the way, the way the pipeline would be built. Um, so most of you may, not, may know that there's a big a one and a half million gallon county tank. It's the uh, cream colored tank on West Road. And so the system would be attached here. And because of the way this, this tank, uh, the way this system operates, uh, water can only be supplied to the pipeline at night. So the first thing that had to be built was a, um, a buffer tank right here um, at the, in the first design, 250,000 gallons. So you could fill that during the night and then pump water into the pipeline all day long. 
So the pipeline was intended to run 24-7 uh, for much of the year as needed. So there'd be a first pump station here next to that tank and then a pipeline along West Road on DOE land and then pipeline following the Camp May Road all the way up to the ski area and feeding the uh, 250,000 gallon tank and also the uh, potable water tank up here. And it would require, in addition to the pump station here, require three more pump stations at uh, elevation, e even elevation separations along the road. So that was the concept. Um, so to go back now to the property transfer issue, um, the two th it turned out that the 2014 plan didn't work. Uh, turned out to be unworkable because um, Los Alamos National Bank was not satisfied with the small amount of land to act that uh, PRLP would have as collateral for the loan. So that's just not enough uh, in terms of value to pin down that loan. Also, the county was unwilling to hold the <clears throat> bulk of the Parito land, which, which had a lien on it from the bank. So... Um, this, this whole thing was kind of going on in the background between um, PRLP and the county and, and, um, and the bank, and the ski club was sort of cut out of this discussion. So we didn't know entirely what was going on. Um, but in the, So it became clear anyway by the spring of, of 2017 that uh, uh, we had to come up with a different model. And by the spring of 2017, uh, Parito Rec had operated Parito for three years, so we had <clears throat> we had some experience. They'd covered the staff costs, equipment repairs, loan payments. They'd made some minor operational improvements, and altogether they <clears throat> they'd shown serious intent and good faith. And they were losing money the whole time. Um, so then to move forward, um, James Coleman, P uh, MCP, proposed that they should actually own all the club land within Los Alamos, within Los Alamos County. They proposed that in the, the spring of 2017. And initially the board w was inclined to reject the offer. But after, we, after the board uh, thought about it for a while, it seemed like more and more that there really wasn't any other way to proceed and still have skiing in Los Alamos County. So in the end, they, the board came around and spent quite some time informing the ski club membership about this whole thing and, and why this was, <clears throat> was the way to go. There were several ski club meetings. And in the end, the club voted to authorize the board to negotiate this new plan in August of 2017. Then the board retained a lawyer because there was a lot of work, legal work to do to negotiate the contract. So in addition to um, transferring the land and buildings and equipment, Mountain Capital Partners uh, was taking over the, the debt and covered all the Pareto operating costs. And they also agreed to pay half the cost of the pipeline, which was then thought to be 3.4 million, up to a, some kind of ceiling of 2 million. And the board worked very strongly for months to get uh, covenants, strong covenants put in place in the transfer deed to, con to guarantee that uh, we would have continued access for recreation on all the land, hiking, biking, etc., and that um, un undesired activities like hunting, logging, drilling, etc., would be prohibited, and that um, in case um, PRLP or, M or MCP decided they had to sell the land, that Los Alamos County would get right of first refusal in case of that, so they could, it would revert back to the county if the county wanted it. So this whole process took almost a year, and was finalized in June of 2018. And so now, Parvito Mountain is operated as part of the Mountain Capital Partnership family. And uh, they own now nine ski areas in the western part of the U.S., and also via Nevado ski area in Chile. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing. Um, the advantages of Parito operating within this 
within the system are that when you buy the Parito Power Pass to ski at Parito, you also can ski free at all these other areas, except for the Valle Nevado. I think, I think you get seven free days at, in Chile if you want to go down there. Um, also, ski area insurance is now part of a multi-area <laughs> coverage, so quite a bit cheaper for each ski area. The, our computer system was upgraded and communicates properly now with the home office in Durango and with other ski areas in the system. And there's better rental equipment available because of uh, having these other areas that we can uh, take from. Um, Mountain Capital Partners in league with the county has lobbied very strongly for state capital improvement project pipeline funds. And the, um, in 2021, the storage pond was relined in order to it, make it uh, leak proof. They put down a thick plastic armor layer over the old leaky liner, and then a new ceiling liner over the armor layer, and the pond is now holding water. And it could have been full this spring, but um, for the uh, fact that uh, the collection weir pump at the bottom of Big Mother, um, both pumps failed. And uh, I have to say the county wasn't, wasn't really uh, aggressive in pursuing the repairs of that pumping system. So anyway, it's a disappointment, but next year. Um, so uh, in all of this, the ski club still exists. There's still a board. And the ski club still retains ownership of the West Land. So I'll show you a few pictures of some of the other areas that um, Mountain Capital Partners manages. One of the big ones is Purgatory, Colorado, my favorite. Uh, there's Nordic Valley in Utah, Willamette, Willamette Pass in Oregon, Bryan Head in southern Utah, and Arizona Snow Bowl and uh, Valle Nevado in Chile. And there's, there's four areas I don't show. Of course, uh, our own area, Sipapu, um, uh, Hesperus, little area along the road between Durango and Cortez. And uh, the most recent acquisition is Lee Canyon, fairly, which is fairly near Las Vegas. So, <clears throat> The pipeline, while this was going on, the pipeline was trundling through the environmental assessment review, and since some design changes were made by MCP. The, um, the, the EA process took quite a long time, 2018 to 2021, looking at the impact on the environment, on, on antiquities, uh, and two protected species, the Mexican spotted owl, shown here, and the Hamas <coughs> Mountain Salamander. It's about three inches long, and I don't think anybody's seen one of these things for years. I think a number of them were seen when, when uh, Salamander Gully was being built, hence the name. Um, the design performance of the pipeline was upgraded by MCP in 21. They doubled the throughput from 250 GPM to 500 and put two pumps in each station for redundancy. Uh, the buffer tank also doubled. Um, the pipe diameter went from 6 inches to 10 inches. And importantly, uh, with this new arrangement, the storage pond can be filled in two weeks instead of four. And this allows the pond to be refilled several times in the winter, <coughs> which means that a lot more snowmaking can go on. And if MCP adds more a uh, storage pond facility up, to, up on the mountain. Uh, together, that really increases the potential for, for a much larger uh, snowmaking slope coverage in the future. So that's the last slide. <clears throat> What's the status of the pipeline? Um, the DPU, the Utilities Department, will handle construction, operation, and maintenance. And uh, they want to put the power line in the same trench as the pipeline, that added to the cost, get rid of the overhead power line uh, so that we no longer have to suffer power outages or, mm -hmm. or um, threat of forest fire from branches falling on or trees falling on the uh, power line. So uh, the design changes in inflation have increased the cost 
and you have to hold your breath, $15 million is the current estimated cost. And I talked to uh, James Allery just this afternoon to get the latest number, and that's what he told me. Um, so where's the money coming from? <clears throat> the county, both the county and Mountain Capital Partners, each contributing $2 million, so that's $4 million. The county has, was able to get $7 million from the state uh, this, during the last legislative, legislative session based on the idea that um, having this system in place would improve the firefighting capacity in the east part of the Hamas Mountains. The county and Mountain Capital Partners are pursuing the rest of the funding from federal sources uh, so far without any uh, success. Um, construction hopefully will begin in 2024 on at least part of the line. And uh, when it's built, I think it is going to be built, so it's only a question of when. The county has got to use this money within two years from the time they acquire it, so that's an incentive to start, to <coughs> start digging. Um, pipeline will make a dramatic difference at the mountain, and once it's operational, I think we expect that uh, MCP will begin capital upgrades to modernize the ski area and make it financially successful. Um, they have been doing that sort of thing at all the other, or most of the other uh, ski areas that they have un under their management. So this is uh, the trail map still as it is. 37 slopes, five chairlifts, 1,200 vertical. It's really has the potential to be a great ski area, I think, and rival Ski Santa Fe for sure. Maybe not Taos, but Ski Santa Fe. As you heard, we've got a new general manager, Jason Bellamy, and I think, I think I saw him come in. He's from Saddleback Mountain in Maine. So, Jason, are you up there? Okay. Woo <laughs> so, that's the end of my talk. And um, if you have the patience, uh, maybe time for a question or two. Yes, let's thank the speaker. If you have a question, raise your hand, and the mic will come your way. Okay, so you said with the Westland, the deal with transferring that, the problem was the right of first refusal. Mm -hmm. um, like, what? why is that a problem, and is that going to be any easier in the future? Well, it's partly a problem because hmm. nobody knows where the Dunnigan family descendants are. <laughs> and so far, the, I don't think there's been a really serious attempt to research the uh, family connections, but there's been no contact with, with the uh, younger generation of Dunnigans, wherever they are. So um, I don't, I'm not the right person to ask about whether there's any um, termination of the RF, ROFR at some point in the future. There may be a statute of limitations that makes it go away. I know that um, James Coleman is looking into ways in which that ORFR can be um, circumvented in some way. In the meantime, uh, the club still owns it, and uh, so it, and it's a little bit of leverage to make sure with the community to make sure that uh, Mountain Capital Partners does what they said they're going to do. Excellent. Are, are there more questions? Hmm. Ron Strong once told me how Breathless and Fudges got named, but I never heard how Sidewinder and uh, another mother got named. I wonder if you might tell us. Well, here's Ron. <laughs> Where is Ron? Right oh. I'm not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> The question was, do you, do you know how uh, Sidewinder. Sidewinder and another mother got named? Uh, well, another mother is kind of uh, elemental. Yeah, uh, elementary. Yeah. We even had plans for yet another mother, but <laughs> yeah. uh, never, never uh, came to end the being. 
Um, let's see, Sidewinder, we kind of decided that uh, we ought to have a, a Spanish named Slope. And uh, since it kind of meandered back and forth, a, uh, we decided that, well, uh, what's a, a Sidewinder's name in, uh, in uh, Spanish? And it turns out it's Cascabel, which didn't, you know, nobody know what that was, so we just stuck with Sidewinder since it kind of meanders. Right. Thank you so much. One last question. On September 9th, we saw a deer being fished out of the pond. I'd like to know if it survived. Was, I assume it was had been tranquilized. Um, it, no, it was just so tired and cold. The water was so cold that it was basically uh, hypothermic. Um, and it was drowning, and they were... Uh, Paul's back there and can tell you in first person, but he's told me the story, so I can, I'll recount it. Um, the, the deer was about to drown, and the various uh, fish and game and wildlife people said, you can't touch that deer because, um, you know, there'll, there'll be a $10,000 fine if you touch it. But finally, Paul was able to call the state game warden, and he was 20 minutes away, and Paul said, this deer's going to be dead in 20 minutes. So game warden gave him permission to last year to pull it up. And they pulled it up, got it on land, and uh, it survived. Hmm. Well, thanks, so, Paul. So, I um, want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank the speaker. That was fantastic. And also, if we could honor the amazing teams that made our Pajarito ski area be a reality today for us to enjoy. Thank you. I would